In August 1939, Poland braced for the inevitable. Germany had brazenly remilitarized the Rhineland and annexed Czechoslovakia's Sudetenland, while the West watched helplessly. Soon, the world's most powerful military force would storm through Poland. Even with a million valiant troops, Poland was outmatched by the modern mechanized Wehrmacht. While Britain and France tried to placate Hitler, the Poles knew Germany would stop at nothing to reclaim the Polish corridor, seize the free city of Danzig, and reunite Germany's divided territories. Both nations sensed the brewing storm, yet pretended all was calm to outwit their enemy. Covert operations and cunning deceptions set the stage for an unseen battle of wits. In a move straight out of Greek mythology, Germany sent the warship SMS Schleswig-Holstein on a ceremonial visit to Danzig. Inside, hundreds of German soldiers lay in wait, ready for war. At dawn on September 1, 1939, SMS Schleswig-Holstein unleashed the first salvo of World War II on the Westerplatt naval base in a surprise assault meant to crush Polish defenses in minutes. However, the Germans had been deceived. The Poles had their own surprise waiting. Hitler was hell-bent on seizing Danzig, ready to ignite Europe to claim it. Historically, Danzig was a complex city, a bustling port that had never truly belonged to any modern nation. Instead, it was part of the Hanseatic League, a powerful alliance of merchant guilds dominating Europe from the 13th to the 17th centuries. Danzig was predominantly German-speaking, and when the German Empire was forged in 1871, it became a crucial part of Prussia. Throughout World War I, Danzig remained under German control. However, the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, which ended World War I, redrew Europe's political map. The treaty established the free city of Danzig, a semi-autonomous city-state under the League of Nations protection. This was designed to give Poland access to a seaport, ensuring its economic independence and a crucial outlet to the Baltic Sea. For Germany, losing Danzig was a bitter defeat. The city had been integral to Prussia and later the German Empire. Its loss crystallized the territorial and economic humiliations inflicted by the Treaty of Versailles, stoking national resentment and a thirst for revenge. The Nazi regime, rising to power in the 1930s, exploited this sentiment. Hitler viewed reclaiming Danzig as essential to undoing the post-World War I settlements and restoring German pride and power. Strategically, regaining Danzig would bolster Germany's grip on the Baltic and secure vital maritime routes. Poland, on the other hand, saw Danzig as crucial for its economic independence and national security. Losing the city would doom Poland to being a perpetual second-rate player in Europe. Danzig was Poland's primary access point to the sea, vital for its exports and imports. Handing it over to Germany would cripple Poland's economic lifeline and leave it wide open to further German aggression. The Polish government was steadfast in maintaining its sovereignty and territorial integrity against German expansionism. The painful memories of past partitions and foreign dominations made Polish leaders resolute in their refusal to bow to German demands, even against overwhelming odds. The clash over Danzig was more than just a territorial dispute. It was a battle for national honor and survival. The situation hit a boiling point in 1939, when Germany demanded Danzig's incorporation into the Reich and the construction of an extraterritorial highway and railway through the Polish corridor, separating East Prussia from the rest of Germany. Poland, bolstered by guarantees from Britain and France, refused these demands, setting the stage for war. Poland knew it didn't have the military might to resist a German invasion outright. However, they believed Hitler wouldn't risk defying the Western Allies again. If he did, surely Britain and France would step in. Yet German troops were gathering along the Polish border, making it clear that war was imminent. On paper, Hitler had promised not to invade Poland and Britain and France had pledged to declare war if he did. Officially, there was nothing to worry about. Both the Germans and Poles knew the stark reality. Each side secretly prepared for the inevitable clash. 
Germany tried to mask the scale of its invasion plans, while Poland discreetly readied its defences. The free city of Danzig, one of the main reasons for the conflict, posed a particularly imposing problem for Poles. Surrounded by German territory, most of its residents were German-speaking and sympathetic to Nazi ideals. For Polish armed forces to reach the city, they would have to traverse the long and thin Polish corridor, which would be swallowed by war as soon as Germany crossed the border. Poland could not send additional troops in peacetime, which would escalate the conflict further. There were no options for the Polish minority in the city, who faced the grim threat of eradication. To mount a defence, Poland's only significant foothold was a small naval depot on the Westerplatte Peninsula, just outside Danzig. A mere few hundred metres from the city port, this base would be crucial if the Germans attacked. By August 1939, the Polish garrison at Westerplatte numbered just 88 men. Reinforcing the defences or sending additional troops would have immediately tipped off German sympathisers and undercover operatives in Danzig. Furthermore, the East Prussian city of Elbing, just 37 miles away, made it easy for the Germans to launch a swift military response if they suspected Poland was bolstering their base. If Poland were to brace for the worst, they would have to do it secretly. Two secretive plots were hatched. Adolf Hitler aimed to strike the naval base at Westerplatte right at the invasion's outset, preventing any reinforcement attempt. To pull off this surprise assault, Germany needed at least one warship stationed at the port of Danzig before the conflict erupted. In a move reminiscent of the Trojan horse strategy from ancient Greece, Germany deployed SMS Schleswig-Holstein, an old Deutschland-class battleship launched back in 1905, to pay the port of Danzig a ceremonial visit. This venerable battleship, a storied veteran of World War I, had made her mark at the Battle of Jutland. Yet, by 1939, she was considered a relic, not a severe naval threat. In late August 1939, SMS Schleswig-Holstein sailed into the port on a so-called goodwill mission. She docked at the Westerplatte Peninsula beside the Polish military transit depot, lying in wait for the fateful dawn of September 1, 1939. Despite the tense geopolitical climate, the old warship didn't arouse suspicion. The Polish military transit depot was separated from the port by a harbour channel linked to the mainland by a tiny pier and secluded from the rest of Danzig by a brick wall guarded by five watchhouses in the surrounding forest. The depot's strategic position made the covert battleship essential for taking the Polish stronghold once the fighting began. Polish authorities could do little about the German battleship's presence in their port. Danzig was, after all, a free city. German vessels could dock there if invited by local authorities. Whether the city's residents were aware of the ship's true purpose remains a mystery. Given the numerous Nazi sympathizers in town, it's hard to believe none were in on the plot. Nevertheless, the Polish authorities were unaware that deep within the ship's hull, 225 Wehrmacht shock troopers lay in wait, along with massive stockpiles of munitions ready to be unleashed upon the small Polish garrison at Westerplatte. Ironically, while the Germans were deceiving the Polish with their ceremonial visit, they too were being misled in ways they could not have anticipated. Poland had no idea they had a German battleship filled with enemy troops right on their harbour, waiting to attack at any moment. However, they were aware that war was imminent and that the free city of Danzig would be a prime target for Germany. Poland embarked on a secret mission to fortify their naval depot at Westerplatte. Each night, dock workers left the base disguised as Polish soldiers. And by morning, real soldiers had taken their place. Nazi spies operating in Danzig were thus deceived into believing the naval base housed no more than 88 men, when in reality, over 200 troops were stationed there. Bit by bit, the Polish military replaced all civilian workers at the naval depot with soldiers. However, sheer numbers wouldn't be enough to slow the German advance. So, 
The Polish garrison secretly constructed an advanced network of defensive structures around the naval base. This covert operation was grueling and painstaking. The garrison had to build bunkers, ditches, trenches, barbed wire fences, and reinforced concrete walls entirely under wraps. They could not rely on local help which added to the challenge. For months, construction took place mainly under the cover of night, with soldiers working in silence to avoid detection. Every hammer strike and shovel dig was meticulously timed and muffled, ensuring the Nazis remained oblivious to the activity. As September approached, the Polish had dramatically reinforced Westerplatz's naval base. The Germans, reassured by the local Danzig police, believed the lightly defended post, supposedly home to only 88 men, would fall in less than 10 minutes. Convinced of an impending decisive victory, the Germans placed much of their confidence in their secret plan to attack using SMS Schleswig-Holstein and the shock troopers hidden within its hull. Both sides, meticulously planning in the shadows, were about to spring their traps on each other. World War II erupted in the early hours of September 1st, 1939, when Adolf Hitler ordered German troops to invade Poland. Codenamed Fall Weiss, or Case White, this directive set the stage for a massive and coordinated assault. At precisely 4.45 a.m., SMS Schleswig-Holstein turned her guns on the Polish naval depot and garrison at Westerplatt. The night's tranquility was violently shattered by the thunderous roar of the German battleship's artillery, raining munitions onto the fortified defences at Westerplatt. This marked the first battle of the war. Simultaneously, German forces launched coordinated attacks along Poland's western, northern and southern borders. The worst-case scenario for the Poles had become a stark reality. Poland's forces, though courageous, were unprepared for the sheer scale and ferocity of the German Blitzkrieg strategy, which combined air raids, artillery bombardment and rapid tank assaults. The Luftwaffe bombed Polish cities, airfields and military targets, causing widespread destruction and panic. Germany justified the invasion with a series of fabricated events and propaganda, including the infamous Gleiwitz incident. German operatives staged a fake Polish attack on a German radio station. Using this false flag operation to portray Poland as the aggressor and justify their military response. Amidst the chaos, the Polish lines rapidly crumbled across the nation. However, the defenders at Westerplatte were preparing to unleash their own surprise. In their eagerness, the Germans had positioned their battleship too close to the naval base, causing their largest shells to fail to explode on impact. Despite the deafening din of battle engulfing the entire base, the initial attack inflicted no casualties. This allowed the Polish commander to send a distress message. Quote, SOS, I'm under fire. As SMS Schleswig-Holstein repositioned, its cannons roared with deafening fury, shattering the morning calm and raining devastation on the Polish base. Amid the thunderous bombardment, 225 German soldiers stealthily slipped from the vessel under the cover of darkness. Their mission to execute a surprise ground assault on the naval depot while the Polish defenders were preoccupied. The Germans breached the artillery-scarred brick wall at the border, moving with disciplined precision across the 220-yard stretch. Their boots crunched on the rubble-strewn ground as they advanced, rifles ready. The silence was shattered as they reached the Polish outpost, and the trap sprung. Hidden Polish defenders erupted from concealed positions. Gunfire rattled through the air, bullets slicing through the Germans' ranks, Polish forces, in a masterstroke of coordination, unleashed a barrage of artillery and mortar fire. Explosions rocked the battlefield, flinging dirt and debris into the air, creating a hellish landscape. The Germans, caught in the crossfire, scrambled for cover, but there was no respite. The Poles had anticipated every move, and their defensive strategy was meticulously planned to maximize chaos and destruction. The SMS Schleswig-Holstein itself was not spared. Shells from Polish artillery hammered the battleship, sending plumes of smoke and flames skyward. The once unstoppable war machine now seemed vulnerable amidst the relentless assault. 
As if the battle wasn't chaotic enough, a new threat emerged. A maritime unit of the Danzig police approached from the west, their boats slicing through the choppy waters, aiming to land on the depot's shores. The Polish defenders, already stretched thin, now faced an onslaught from yet another direction, their resolve and strategy put to the ultimate test amidst the chaos and carnage. However, the Polish defenders maintained complete control over the surrounding area, their disciplined firepower forcing the Danzig police to flee in disarray. Machine gun bursts and rifle shots echoed across the waterfront, cutting down the advancing police unit and driving the survivors back into the sea under a hail of bullets. Minutes later, amidst the chaos and carnage of the ambush, the battered German soldiers frantically radioed the SMS Schleswig-Holstein. Their voices crackled with urgency and desperation over the radio, reporting their retreat. The Polish defenders had inflicted devastating casualties, and the once confident German troops now found themselves retreating in disarray, their ranks decimated by the meticulous Polish defense. Hours later, the German infantry regrouped and launched another attempt to storm the naval base. Once again, they were met with relentless Polish defensive actions, encountering mines, felled trees, barbed wire and intense crossfire from multiple directions. The Germans were eventually forced to abandon the idea of a ground attack until SMS Schleswig-Holstein could sufficiently weaken the Polish defences for another attempt. The post that was supposed to be taken in less than 10 minutes held firm for several days in a spectacle of tenacity and strategic brilliance from the Polish defenders. As time dragged on, the Germans grew increasingly desperate, their frustration mounting with each failed attempt to neutralize the resolute Polish garrison. German commanders had gravely underestimated the capabilities of the Westerplatte garrison. The initial confidence dissolved into a harsh realization as their assaults were repelled time and again. In response, they overcompensated, convinced that the Poles had constructed an extensive network of underground and armored fortifications across the peninsula. The Germans believed the garrison was equipped with multiple artillery units, unaware that the Poles were down to just a few remaining mortars. Determined to crush the resistance, the Germans launched a massive offensive against the tiny naval depot. The relentless bombardment began with continuous naval fire, shells exploding against the fortifications with thunderous impacts. This was followed by relentless artillery shelling, the ground shaking under the constant barrage. Then the sky filled with the ominous drone of engines as 60 Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers appeared. The planes screamed through the air, diving low to release their deadly payloads. Explosions rocked the depot as 26.5 tons of explosives rained down, turning the landscape into a hellish inferno. The ground trembled and fire and smoke filled the air creating an apocalyptic scene of destruction. The relentless onslaught finally took its toll on the brave Polish defenders. They suffered considerable casualties, lost their mortars and their only working radio, and saw their remaining food supplies destroyed. The appalling shelling swallowed the Polish base in dust and smoke, ironically shielding them from further attacks for a limited time. Depleted and severely injured, the Polish garrison considered surrendering but chose to continue the resistance. With the Germans treading lightly, they repelled numerous enemy probing attacks, convinced they were facing a large, well-fortified force. By September 6th, the Wehrmacht had overwhelmed most of Poland, with a massive force already at the gates of Warsaw. Yet the small naval depot where the first shots of World War II were fired continued to hold out, a stubborn thorn in the side of the advancing German war machine. Frustrated by several fruitless attacks, the Germans began executing more cunning incursions. At 3 a.m. on September 6th, they sent a burning cart toward the Polish positions. The plan backfired when the terrified driver uncoupled prematurely. The rigged cart fell short of its target, an oil cistern, and instead ignited the nearby forest, inadvertently providing the Poles with invaluable cover. By September 7th, the Poles were nearing the end of their supplies and endurance. Many men had been lost, and the survivors were either injured or suffering from gangrene. Despite this, the heroic garrison prepared to withstand one final assault. The Germans launched a ferocious attack, descending on the post with flamethrowers and explosives. The air was thick with acrid smoke, 
and the heat of the flamethrowers as they swept through the Polish positions, targeting the remaining guardhouses. Explosions shattered the last shelters where the Poles had taken refuge, the blast waves sending debris flying and engulfing the area in flames. After this devastating assault, the defenders could no longer continue the fight. Their numbers were decimated, their fortifications reduced to rubble, and their bodies battered beyond endurance. The surviving Polish soldiers were finally forced to capitulate. The small naval depot, which had stood as a beacon of defiance, fell silent. At 9.45 a.m. on September 7, 1939, a white flag appeared over the ramparts of the Polish naval depot. For seven grueling days, the small garrison of resolute men had held back the German advance even as the rest of the country fell. Their defiance had tied down over 3,000 German troops, several warships and artillery units, creating a legendary stand against overwhelming odds. The garrison's endurance was not without a high cost. Although superior in number and firepower, the German forces suffered 200 casualties at the hands of the fierce resistance mounted by the Poles. The Polish defenders, though outnumbered and outgunned, lost 55 brave souls. The German commander was so impressed with his Polish counterpart's bravery and tactical acumen that he allowed him to keep his ceremonial Polish sabre, even after he had been taken prisoner of war. This gesture was an acknowledgement of the honor and valor displayed by the defenders in the face of insurmountable odds. A few days later, Adolf Hitler himself visited the city of Danzig. He inspected the depot at Westerplatte, the very site where the first shots of World War II had been fired. Despite his aggressive ambitions, he expressed respect for the defensive efforts of the Polish men. But the wreckage and ruins bore silent witness to the fierce battle that had taken place. A somber reminder of the courage and sacrifice of the defenders who had made a stand that would echo through history 